Well, well, happy Thanksgiving week to everybody. Happy Thanksgiving week. We're going to start off this morning in Matthew chapter 26, for those of you who like to follow along. And, and uh, it's, a, it's a glorious season. I just, I mean, we've, we've talked about what God's doing in this season, but I'm, I'm just, I'm feeling a renewed sense of his peace being released to his people. And, you know, we, we're, we're just, we're being shaped up for the things that he has prepared for our future. Just feeling a renewed sense of, of hopefulness and, and, and joy. I want to read this. It's uh, often a communion scripture. Starting in verse 26, it says, And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. It, it uses the word blessing there. Uh, the, the inference attached to that word in the original language uh, is that he was thankful. Uh, it, it's, it is a sense of, of, of he blessed it, uh, but it's kind of like when we ask somebody to give the blessing over the food, right? What do we usually start with? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, that you provided this. It's a recognition that he's provided. Of course, then we, you know, we pray usually that he would sanctify it as well. Uh, and it, it kind of expresses this sentiment of thankfulness a little bit better in verse 27. It says, and when he had taken the cup and given thanks... He gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Have you, have you ever really pondered this, this moment in the history of Jesus' earthly ministry? And just, just take and pause to, to really put yourself in Jesus' shoes here in this very moment. He's literally prophesying his death. And, and, and not just prophesying it, but then he's actually uh, doing a prophetic act, what we would call a prophetic act. You know, uh, this, is, this is my body, this bread, as he holds up this bread, and, and he's literally breaking it into 12 pieces, you know? He's break, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's prophesying of his body that'll be broken and brutally beaten in. The lashes that he would take in his body for us. He's, he's, he's prophesying of what he's about to undergo as he's ripping apart this bread and breaking it and distributing it to the disciples who were present, the apostles and so forth. This is my, you know, this is the cup of my, of my blood, the blood of the covenant. Well, the only time blood flows like wine is when there's a horrific tragedy, Right? Here Jesus is, he's, he's looking down at the, at the cross. It's not very long now. And these things which he's enacting here are, are going to unfold for real. You know, this is the cup of my blood, this, this blood that's about to be spilled for you, this horrific torture that I'm about to undergo uh, for your sake. He's, he's, he's prophesying it uh, over them. And yet, in, in the midst of that, I just, I, I don't know how, we, did, we have to meditate on it and, and, and ask Holy Spirit to, to come and really reveal it to us, because I don't think we fully get a hold of the pressure of this moment. I mean, Jesus is, is, is acknowledged, he's prophesied, he, he, none of this is going to take him by surprise. Like, these things are about to take place, and in, in, in the midst of that pressure, in the midst of the agony that he must have felt, even the confusion in the room on what is, what is he talking about? In the middle of that, Jesus is found still remaining thankful. Father, I thank you. <laughs> I, I, I wanna make sure we're getting the picture clear. Uh, this is my body, Father, thank you. This is my blood. Father, thank you. What did Jesus have to be thankful for? What in the world did Jesus have to be thankful for? He was about to be murdered. I mean, the Bible says that they did some pretty horrible things to him. He was beaten unrecognizably. 
Like, who is that? Jesus, I don't know, we can't tell. They've beaten him so badly he's deformed and swollen and bleeding. You know, like, he's about to be murdered. And, and, and I would submit to you, like, murdered and hung on a cross for people who didn't really care, <laughs> right? I mean, do we really see people flocking around Jesus being like, so thankful for what you're about to do for me? No, he didn't really see that. <laughs> he was, he was probably beginning to feel pretty lonely in this moment, wouldn't you think? He's, he's about to go on trial, he's about to go to the cross, about to be brutally murdered for a people who don't seem to care, who don't understand what he's, what, what he's about to do. You know, he's, he's just spent the last three years of his life, three years, like living with men who 24 hours a day he's sowing his life into, barring some sleep that he got once in a while. He's, he's pouring everything that he's got into these, and he knows full well as he sits at this table that one of these guys that he's sown his whole life into is about to betray him. Have you ever been betrayed by a close friend? I'm just going to, I mean, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and think, <laughs> if that's happened to you, you weren't the most thankful in that moment. And not only Judas, you know, who of course was prophesied, would abandon him, but, but all of them. Can you imagine? It seems like sometimes this is, <laughs> well, I'll leave that alone. <laughs> Can you imagine pouring your life out? I mean, giving everything to a group of people only to have them walk away from you and deny that they ever even knew you in your moment of greatest need. Can you imagine? I can't, thankfully. The same crew who was getting ready to abandon him, they were, they were utterly clueless despite Jesus plainly stating many times what he was about to do and for what he was about to do it. You know, they still remained utterly clueless, which if you could just imagine, you're, you're pouring your life out. The people who you know better than anybody in, in, in life are all with you and they can't get a hold of what you're trying to communicate to them and how, again, how lonely that must have felt or made Jesus feel like in, in this moment and not only were they clueless, they were also exasperating. <laughs> you know? and Jesus continues to sow and sow and sow. And if you remember, there were times when he was like, ah, like, how much longer do I have to be with you people? And they were exasperating. <laughs> you know, you have James and John who, like, after being with Jesus for a while, thought that it would be a good idea to rain down lightning and to literally wipe out an entire village. I don't think you're getting it, guys. Like, like I don't know what you saw in Jesus, but ah, nothing was recorded that looked like that, right? It's just like, oh, he's got to be just exasperated with these guys. You've got Peter, Right? Peter wasn't even just uh, James and John. Similarly, it's funny. It's all the ones that were the closest to Jesus who were the biggest, you know, characters. And, uh, you, have, you, know, you, have, you have the apostle Peter who's standing in front of Jesus. He, he thinks that he's meaning well, but he's so jacked up and so full of the devil that Jesus doesn't even talk to him. He just straight up rebukes the devil to his face. His, like, favorite disciple, Peter. <laughs> the one whose shadow in the future is going to fall and people are going to get healed. He doesn't even, Peter, you don't even know what's going on. No, he goes straight for the devil. He is so full of Satan that Jesus just addresses the devil straight, straight on, right? Like, this is the motley crew that's around Jesus. Of course, the, the religious elite, they, they never got it, you know? Uh, how about positioning your life for the day that Jesus would come, and then he comes and you're clueless. You got nothing. I don't know. Who is this guy? Who is this guy who, strangely, is now doing miracles and signs and wonders? That hasn't happened in 400 years. This, surely, this isn't the Son of God that we've been looking for. It couldn't possibly be. This is Jesus from Nazareth. This is he, Joseph's son, the carpenter. Now imagine being Jesus. I'm like, for real? 
No, I mean, Jesus was the best personality. I'm sure he was a full-on D, you know. <laughs> Which would make him even more frustrating. I'm being teasing, but would make him even more frustrating in these moments. Like, seriously, I've invested three years of my life, not just in my apostles, but I've invested it even in you Pharisees, even in you religious elite, religious leaders. I've, you know, continually, I've rebuked you for your stupidity. Continually, I've demonstrated the kingdom of God before you. And all you have ever done for the last three years is mock up some weird, erroneous YouTube videos like every week where you claimed that I was full of demons. Like, how much of this can I continue to take? This is ridiculous. The ones who should have seen him come and they were the ones who were accusing him of demons. And I, I find it fascinating that even from the earliest times of of church history that those who are readily accusing others of having demons seem to be the ones that are most influenced by demons and yet they don't even know it because they're deceived. Fascinating, isn't it? You know? What did Jesus have to be thankful for? Even his own family thought he was nuts. Mark chapter 3. Can you believe that? What were you thinking, Mary? Did not an angel visit you? Like, like... You, you, you had a birth supernaturally. Did you forget that? Yet somehow, the whole family's like, oh, I think Jesus is crazy. I don't know what he's thinking. I don't know what he's thinking. How could you not know what he was thinking? Like, of all people, your own mother is calling you out as a kook. Go back and look at it, Mark chapter 3. I don't know about you, but when Mama starts thinking I'm crazy, <laughs> starting maybe to feel like I'm. Not so thankful. Isaiah 53 tells us that Mary and Joseph had to be some homely looking people too. Because it says that Jesus had absolutely nothing in his appearance that would attract us to him. So the dude was ugly. So he couldn't even fall back on, well, at least I'm good looking. <laughs> Like, okay, nobody gets me. Not even my own family gets me. Like, nobody knows why I'm here. Like, <laughs> like hello. You know, I, literally everybody's against me at every turn. I've evaded crowds. They've been trying to murder me before my time. They, like, even my own apostles who have poured my life in, like, they're, ugh, they're exasperating. My own mother thinks that I'm nuts, right? And when I look into the mirror, long hair is just not attractive on me. <laughs> what did Jesus have to be thankful about? Have you considered that? How many of you, with all of those things coming against you, would be able to see anything in your life except for negative? And all of a sudden we find out that thankfulness to a large degree has everything to do with our perspective. What did you have to be thankful for, Jesus? Uh, nothing was going well. And, and honestly, like, we didn't, even, we didn't see him complaining. I mean, <laughs> I may have worked myself into thankfulness, but probably there had been some complaining on the front end. What were you thinking, dude? <laughs> Why did you send me down to these people? These guys are crazy. Nobody's getting it. All the stuff that we came to accomplish, like they're not, they're not getting it. They don't understand why I'm here. They don't understand who I am. Peter was got the closest, you know, he had the revelation from you saying that I'm the son of God, the Messiah who was to come. But even he was so full of the devil that he was trying to screw up your plans. Like, you know, and, and like I would be like, okay, it's time for plan B. You know, just air vac me out of this place, send some angels. It's time for plan B. Hey, hey, you remember when Moses was walking around and you got all like crazy? We were going to wipe out all the Israelites back then again. Remember that when you, and like Moses intervened? Uh, I'm thinking we should revisit that because these people are miserable to be with. How many of us <laughs> would look at the story of Jesus' life if we were in his shoes? 
and be able to stand lifting up the representation of your own blood and your own body. And remain 100% thankful without grumbling and complaining. <laughs> it's all about perspective. What reasons do we have to be positive in the midst of what looks like disaster? What reasons do you have to be positive in the middle of your situations that you're dealing with right now? Well, I would submit to you that as we look back at the example in Jesus' story, if we look back at Jesus, we find out in a hurry that God wasn't done yet. Right? God wasn't done yet. If at any point in your life, you hit the pause button and you look around, and you're like, I don't see God doing anything. It looks like everything's a failure. It doesn't look like I'm accomplishing that for which you sent. It doesn't look like anything's advancing. I, I, I want to submit to you today that God's not done yet. You haven't arrived at the end of the story. I mean, in Jesus' story, you know, you have these <laughs> exasperating apostles who go on to be so incredibly powerful that it's said of them they were the ones who turned the world upside down. You and I, we are still, we are the fruit that's still laid up to their account 2,000 years later. <laughs> the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross that day and the resurrection he did three days later has gone absolutely viral over the face of the planet. The word of God that was canon even till today is the best selling work on the planet. It may have looked bleak at a point in time for them, but God wasn't done yet. There would be a day when some of these apostles, they would go to islands like militia. They would heal absolutely every single person that was brought to them sick. You know, the handkerchiefs, aprons sending off the people, getting whole, and demons being cast out. There's shadow, people being lined up in the marketplace in the case of Peter. I'm so impressed by that. So impressed by what I see in him, God in him. These who were exasperating, these who Jesus was like, ah, I'm at the end of my rope with you. How long am I going to have to ah, stay here with you? These became something incredible, didn't they, when it was all done and said. These became the foundation of the church that you and I now know and love. These became wildfire that spread across the entire planet, such that right now, even as I speak, there are more Muslims being saved than at any other point in all of human history. That revival is still continuing to go wild in China despite the government's greatest efforts to keep it from breaking out. You know what's going to happen in China? <laughs> At some point, they're going to be more saved than there are lost, and you're going to see that whole country go flip, and everything in the world economy is going to be different overnight. All of that's because of these apostles. It's because of this story. <laughs> God wasn't done yet. He was still working for good. And Jesus rose again. Jesus rose again on the third day and he literally won the war. What we have experiencing right now, what we're experiencing is not the war. There are little battles. It's the enemy raising his ugly head up to try to just cause disruption. But the war was already won on the cross that day a couple of thousand years ago. Jesus won the victory. Even the enemy was duped in the whole deal. You know, he wouldn't have killed Jesus on that cross if he had thought that ultimately that would result in the victory and the salvation of the planet and the gospel going like wildfire and, and millions upon millions coming into the kingdom of Christ. Boy, it sure didn't look like all that was happening right there. When he was raising the cup that was his blood, and the bread that it was his body with a group of people who all would abandon him with one who would turn him over to the very people who would murder him, ultimately. 
Boy, it sure didn't look like we were going to get here then. What did Jesus have to be thankful for? Jesus had a loving father that was deeply invested in his life, always present, never removed, always there, who loved him more than we can even comprehend, and who was actively engaged and working in the midst of the storm that he faced, such that even though ultimately what he could see with his eyes seemed somehow in contradiction, the end result of the father working was nothing short of miraculous and extravagant. Why was Jesus thankful? Because Father God wasn't done yet. Father God wasn't done yet. Good news is it's not done in your life yet either. Thankfulness, we talked about this just a little bit last week. Thankfulness actually opens up the doors in your life for the release of peace and joy. In fact, I would submit to you that it's impossible actually to have peace in your life unless you are first thankful. We talked about it a little bit last week. We first come in with thanksgiving, and then we submit a request to him, right? The thanksgiving actually prepares a way in your life for you to enter into peace. Part of the reason for that is because thanksgiving combats what we call entitlement. Thanksgiving combats entitlement. If I believe that I'm entitled, I will always think that I deserve something different or something better, and I will never have the peace that Jesus died for me. Thanksgiving is the first step towards crushing entitlement in our life, and it points us to the, re to the reality of where our help actually does come from. Amen? Thankfulness points us back to where our help comes from. Something funny happens to us, I think, the longer that we're saved. I mean, how many of you have been saved 20 years plus? Look at you. That's a big crowd of people there. You know, something happens. Something funny happens to us the, the longer that we're saved. It really, it, 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 at least, I mean, at least if we're doing it right, <laughs> it doesn't matter where we came from. The further along we go, the less we can identify with who we were, the less we can identify uh, with the ways of the world. The, 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 the further along we go in the Lord, you would almost think it would be the opposite to some degree, but the further along we go, almost the more judgmental we could become. And we begin to look onto those who, were, who are exhibiting the same behaviors that you exhibited, he exhibited all the way back then. I mean, the Apostle Paul, looking at the Corinthians, he even declared over them, and such were some of you, right? Well, and such were some of us. We were all sinners in the beginning. <laughs> and, and, and something happens where, as we get a little bit of distance, we, it, it, it's, it's easy for us to forget where we've come from. It's easy for us to forget this reality that we were all just saved by grace, that we were all sinners when he found us all the way back in the very beginning, and that everything we have, everything that we've ever been given has been given by him and purchased by him on the cross. Absolutely everything that I have. This is why we have our first fruits gathering. It's meant to be a reminder that everything I have, I, I don't really have. I'm simply a steward of it. How many of you know you don't own you if you've given your heart to Christ? So that means you actually have nothing. I didn't come into the kingdom with anything, and I'm not going to leave with anything. It's all his. I'm simply a steward. This is what Moses was getting at in Deuteronomy chapter 8, starting in verse 11. He says, do not... Excuse me, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by keeping his commandments and his ordinances and statutes which I am commanding you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and lived in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget that it's the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. See, it's perspective. 
I don't have anything. Nothing that I own is actually mine. I'm simply a steward of it. Everything that I've ever been given, my work ethic given to me by God, it was a gift from him. My desire to go to college, my, my ability to stick through and actually get a degree from him. We often, we look at it and we're like, well, I was the one who did all of the work. You, but you did it by the grace through which he himself provided you. We can't ever get to the place where we're deceived in believing, yep, it was by my hand that I got myself here. It was by my hand that I got all my finances and my life squared away in an order. No, I, I may have had something to do with it, but it was by wisdom that he supplied. Everything that I've got has come from him. Absolutely everything. You have to hear that this morning because the reality is that the only thing that you and I are entitled to is hell. And man, do we forget that. The further along we go in the Lord and the more of our identity of sonship, daughtership we come into where we're like, when we start to believe who we really are, you know, like, I'm a son of the king. You know, we forget where we've come from and we forget this reality that I've been bought with a price that I'm actually not entitled to anything, that everything I have has been a gift from him or a stewardship from him. It's not by my own hand. What do we have to be thankful for? I'm thankful that he reached into the miry clay and pulled me out while I was yet still a sinner. <laughs> that he reached down in and said, you know what, I'm gonna use that guy right there. I'm thankful for the gift of life that it gave me. And understanding from where I've come from should keep things in perspective that at any moment when I start to believe that I deserve more than what I am currently experiencing, I have to be reminded, no. <laughs> but for his mercy and but for this tremendous gift, <laughs> I don't deserve anything. I'm not entitled to anything. Nothing but the fire. We owe everything to God. Thankfulness also reminds us of who's in charge. You know, how many of you know that we're utterly dependent upon Jesus Christ? We're utterly dependent upon God to do anything. Just as Jesus was, didn't, didn't he model that to us? I don't do anything except for what I see the Father in heaven doing. I'm so yoked with Father, so utterly dependent. I, I, don't, I don't say that I can even do anything of myself. I'm not wholly dependent upon the Father. That's you and me. Thankfulness reminds us who's in charge. And the reality is, <laughs> peace to you. <laughs> the reality is if God's in charge, if he's fully engaged in my life, if he's almighty and all-powerful, if he is fully and completely committed to my well-being, he's so committed to my well-being, he actually died for my well-being, Isaiah 53. If that's the case, then that makes him the solution to everything that I'll ever face. Thankfulness re-centers me on that reality. It, thankfulness helps me to continue to rebuild any hope that was lost when I first got that, that bad news. When I first opened that letter, when I first got that phone call, any hope that was lost, thankfulness helps me to recenter on my hope, the one who is my solution. And thankfulness helps me to keep the doors completely closed to the enemy. The Bible is super clear, Psalms 100, that thankfulness is actually a gateway into his presence. Now, we, we, we know from Scripture that our, that our words are incredibly powerful, that our words actually will dictate where we're going, what our, what our future is, where we ultimately arrive, right? We know this. We know that, that, that words in the Spirit, that faith-filled words actually created everything that we see, Right? So thankfulness is not just an internal sentiment, it is an outward exclamation. And this outward exclamation, usually in the Psalms, is tied to praise. 
It's praise to God. Father, I thank you that you're so amazing in these areas. I thank you that you've done this. I thank you that you showed up here. I thank you that you tweaked the way I was thinking over this. I th- you know, it's thankfulness and praise are uniquely oriented together, connected together. They cannot be pulled apart. Psalms 100 says we come into God's presence through the exclamation of thanksgiving to him. So if you find that you're in a pickle today and you need to get a hold of God, you need God to show up in your life, it's time for you to start thanking him. The words further clear that he inhabits our praises, which is really a fancy way of just saying that when we're thanking, when we're praising God, he draws near to us. Now picture this in your mind's eye. If I'm sitting here in my situation that is so small and I start praising and thanking God and God all of a sudden shows up on the scene, God who is light, is there any room left for any darkness at all around me when God shows up? Is there anything that could stand in God's presence? Like when God shows up on my behalf because he's inhabited my praise, everything shifts, everything changes. Thankfulness keeps the door closed to the enemy. And so I want to ask this as we close. If praise from our lips, and we know that what we say is powerful, invites God to inhabit my praises, to draw near to me, to come to my aid in these situations, to cause me to draw into God's presence, if thankfulness does that, what does ungratefulness do? If thankfulness is worship unto God, Who is grumbling worship unto? Who is complaining worship unto? If my praise draws God near, my thankfulness draws him near, and my ungratefulness draws the devil near. And listen, he's looking for an opportunity to give you what you've been saying. The only question I want to leave you with as we roll into a week of Thanksgiving is who do you want to come near you? Without diving off into a whole new teaching, you dictate that by your mouth. You're going to have some opportunities this week. (laughs) You're going to have some opportunities when you leave this house today. Holy Spirit, we invite you in those opportunities that you would bring this to mind, that we would remain so steadfast on you. God, recognizing that we don't need you to show up in a certain way, as we look around at the crazy town sometimes that is our lives, the circumstances, we'll not be discouraged by what we see, God, because we know that you're not done yet. As we look around at people who have yet to change, Somehow again, here's another year gone by and it's the same old saying, oh, Father, we will not get discouraged. We will not be tempted to move into grumbling and complaining. We will not be tempted to be ungrateful because, Jesus, we have so much to be grateful for in you. So much to be grateful for in you. And we just even exclaim right now, we are grateful that you're for us and you're not against us. We're grateful that everything pales in comparison to you. We're grateful, God, that you are ever working on our behalf, working all things for good, for your glory, for the expansion of your kingdom, sharpening us into the likeness of Christ. Thank you that you're concerned about us, God. And thank you that when you draw near to us through praise, nothing can come against us. Nothing can stand. We commit to you, God, to maintain not an entitlement attitude, but a thankful one, a grateful one, because we have just far too much to be grateful for, regardless of our present circumstances, far too much to be thankful for. In Jesus' name, amen.